Dreams Alive! Third films have a tendency to not be that great, or at least when compared to what's gone before, especially when a trilogy wasn't the original plan. In fact, I think I'll go so far as to say that only the Toy Story series not only got better with each film, but the third film was by far the best. Time for the shock of the century. The Dark Knight Rises, which will henceforth be known as Rises in this review, is not the best of the Nolan Batman films. For me, that honour still rests with The Dark Knight. But don't misunderstand me here. Rises is not only an excellent, if open-ended, finish to this unexpected trilogy, it's probably the best film I've seen this year. Frankly, and this may get me lynched, but hey-ho, I found more interest, spectacle, and worthwhile drama in the first 15 minutes of this than I did in the entire two-and-a-half-hour CGI wankfest that was the Avengers slash Avengers Assemble. The acting throughout is fantastic. Sir Michael Caine, Morgan Freeman, and in particular Gary Oldman are their usual brilliant selves. Christian Bell continues to impress as Bruce Wayne slash Batman, even if his Batman voice does occasionally make me smile. No offence is intended here, but Bale seems to have a slight lisp, and when Batman is at his most menacing, swear to me, can ruin the moment. But I think special mention must go out to Tom Hardy for his turn as Bane. Aside from his voice being amazing, it's the perfect combination of cultured and menacing. His physical acting is top-notch. His body language radiates confidence, perhaps even overconfidence. He has certain physical tics that work perfectly for the character, not to mention his sheer physical presence is impressive. And his eyes. As far as Hardy's face is concerned, all he had to act with were his eyes, and the amount of emotion and amount of meaning he managed to convey just with his eyes was brilliant. The story moves at a good pace, and I only felt the near three-hour running time when I tried to stand up at the end. There's plenty of intrigue throughout, and I was fairly impressed at how they tied the three films together without things feeling too forced or too hyper-convenient. The action and effects are, on the whole, pretty damn good, although there is the occasional wobble with the action. On the one hand, the general fight scenes where Batman beats up the hired help are... they're okay. I mean, having seen a fair number of Jackie Chan films, it's a little easier to spot the scenes in the fighting choreography when Batsy takes on a group of thugs. On the other hand, the various vehicle-based action sequences are first-rate, and the Bane vs. Batman smackdowns were very well done, they felt nicely brutal, and they were very emotionally charged. For the effects, now, I love practical effect shots. I find it easier to suspend my disbelief with a model shot than I do with a CGI shot. And this film has some great practical effects going on, especially where vehicle chases are concerned. However, when the effects are by necessity not practical effects, the combination of practical and full CGI effects did jar me out of the film a little bit. Then again, to be fair, the previous films had the same issue. But as I said, this is not, for me at least, as good as The Dark Knight. Because despite being an otherwise excellent film, there are some issues. And almost all of those issues stem from these films not originally being conceived as a trilogy. The Dark Knight worked as a sequel to Batman Begins, because when you get down to it, we had only two new characters we needed to give a damn about, Harvey Dent and the Joker. Aside from a few bits and pieces, Dent is developed over the course of the film, and everything about the Joker is right there on screen in the character and how he acts and how he speaks. Everyone else was either already established in Begins, or else they didn't need that much characterization to serve their purpose in the story. In Rises, we have six new characters that have a significant impact on the story. And out of those six new characters, for about four of them, I'd say, we need either some emotional investment in those characters or some background information on those characters in order for the story to work. This leads to flashbacks, to sub-stories and uh, such like to fill in those blanks. With some day one planning, I think most of that could have been avoided as it could have been set up over the course of the previous two films. Another example is, alas, Catwoman. Before the film came out, a friend of mine asked me what the point of Catwoman was. I glibly responded something like, uh, It's Anne Hathaway in a skin-tight cat suit. I don't 
understand the question. But the thing is, I'm now left wondering that same thing as well. Oh, I understand why she's there. Without spoiling too much, she's the replacement love interest now that Rachel Dawes is spread over large parts of Gotham. But again, the lack of planning means that her character arc, such as it is, is condensed into one film. And she ends up being little more than a stereotypical thief with a heart of gold. Hathaway does a damn good job with what she's given, but it would have been nice for the character to have room to breathe and develop in a more interesting way. Beyond that, my only other gripe is the ending. Or rather, it's the eventful climax before the ending. Now, everything else, anyone could bitch about, I can easily look over and forgive. Either because it's explainable with a bit of thought, it's something that's necessary because this is a film and not a documentary, or because, quite frankly, he's the goddamn Batman. But try as I might, I cannot get the logistics of that situation to work without the use of magic or possibly a warp-capable shuttlecraft. But nevertheless, this is an excellent film. It might not be the best of the three, but it still offered an entertaining end to an unexpected trilogy.